and we're excited. Thank you. <laughs> Let me press continue. Um, and we're excited to discuss political awareness and uh, action within the working class in two separate contexts. Uh, first, unrigging state courts for worker power and then mobilizing voters under political or viral constraints. Um, and so before diving in, I'll just start by making a quick round of intros um, and I'll just give folks names. Um, if I, any of you want to like add anything to your introductions, please feel free to jump in afterwards. Um, but I'm Tristan Brown, um, and I'm the policy and program director at the People's Parity Project. Uh, David Seligman is the executive director of Towards Justice. Uh, Jake Falaschini is the legal director of state courts at Alliance for Justice. And Roland Zello is the director of the Center for Labor and Community Studies at the University of Michigan Dearborn. Um, and so David, Jake, and I will kick it off by talking more about organizing around state courts for worker power. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Roland to share his findings as it relates to mobilizing voters. Um, and so without further ado, I'll just first see if I missed anything from anyone's introductions that you all are super passionate about sharing. Okay, cool. Um, so we can just dive straight in. Um, and so David, I'll just start with you before we start talking about state court specifically to just kind of set the stage for what labor even looks like in the courts. Um, and so there's a broad array of issues when it comes to labor, um, but what are some of the most common uh, pressing labor issues that are litigated in, in the courts, um, especially from your perspective as a workers' rights litigator. Totally. Thanks so much, Tristan. And I'll say, um, the um, I think that that sort of the issues that arise in litigation in courts very often overlap with um, the, the sort of theme of this conversation, which is how we organize around state courts. And I, and I because I, what we're starting to, to, to see and have, have seen for a long time is um, an effort by you know conservative courts to strip things from to strip workers of their right to access courts generally, and also to strip them of their right to access state courts in particular, right? Um, and 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 I think especially as um, I, I become more you know because of the state of the federal judiciary uh, and um, more concerned about case law coming out of the Supreme Court, although um, thanks to um, the amazing organizing of some folks on this call whom I admire very much, including Tristan and Jake, you know, the federal courts at the district court level and the appellate court level are looking much better. I mean, we still have to deal with the, the Supreme Court um, and, and the deck is stacked against us um, in so many ways. So we, so, you know, the, the, I, I think that we will see more increasingly, you know, a, a, a struggle and a push and pull between state and, and, and federal courts. Um, and, and that's a lot of the issues that, uh, that I'm most concerned about in the federal judiciary have to do with that push and pull, most prominently, um, of course, forced arbitration and the proliferation of forced arbitration clauses, um, which I, I think that, that you know, we're all very familiar with now. Um, you know, the majority of non-union workers are required to enter into uh, arbitration clauses that prevent them from accessing the courts and prevent them from banding together in class actions, and class actions being in except, like an exceptionally important and critical tool for workers, especially workers who, who are, you know, would be fearful of, of going against their employer on their own, which we very much know to, to which we know is, is the case. Um, the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the landscape here is, is very, very bad. It's about as bad as it could get. I'll say that it's, it's so bad that we're actually starting to see it I think bottom out a little bit, and some of the recent case law from the Supreme Court has has started to I, 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 um, suggest that the court has pushed the Federal Arbitration Act about as far as it could go. Um, so I know we'll talk about Viking River, and which I think is an interesting case, um, and then there's the Southwest Airlines case um, and um, the Taco Bell case from this term, which are sort of better than some prior um, forced arbitration cases. But forced arbitration. Is a huge issue uh, for for workers, um, and uh, it, it means, in addition to workers not being able to vindicate their rights, it also means that some of the most cutting edge and important issues um, in in labor law now, like never actually are developed in courts through litigation. The way that the way that the way that these issues are supposed to be developed. So, um, and they, they remain cutting edge, even though they shouldn't be cutting edge. You know, I think most prominently um, the um, the misclassification of gig workers, right, which is just not an issue that many courts have had an opportunity to weigh in on, in large part because of forced arbitration clauses um, that prevent those workers from accessing the courts. Um, that's a really key issue. The other one that I, that I want to highlight um, 
which I think is a theme across all of our concern, all of uh, so many of our concerns about the fifth federal judiciary um, and where we're headed is the, the efforts of the Supreme Court to dismantle the administrative state. Um, and that's something that I think we saw very prominently this year when the court um, uh, vacated um, the OSHA's emergency uh, temporary standard regarding vaccines. Um, that is, you know, that that opinion was concerning in ways that, you know, is a topic of a panel on its own and have have, have been the topic of many panels. But I think re reflects that this court is willing to go to great lengths um, to undermine the administrative state, uh, state in service of corporate power and to undermine workers, um, whether it be, you know, by and whether that's uh, worker protections through OSHA or through um, you know, through the NLRB um, uh, or, uh, you know, DOL, um, it, we're very concerned about, um, about, about how those issues will evolve over the, over the coming, coming years. So I appreciate you just being explicit in stating that the landscape of um, the Supreme Court, at least specifically, is one that's really bad. Um, I think for folks who are attending the conference, there may be folks who are lawyers, um, and then I think that there are a lot of organizers who are also attending this conference. And so I know as lawyers, like the cases that we're talking about and the implications like are sometimes covered a lot in legal jargon. Um, but as it relates to the Supreme Court specifically, most recently, um, there was this case Viking River, um, which has been yet another ruling handed down that's kind of been a manifestation of the anti-worker nature, um, at least in the Supreme Court. If you can just kind of talk about that case specifically to like break it down for the lay person who, hears about like a case like Viking River and it's kind of like yeah I don't really know like what that is about anyways but just like what that case really is about what the implications are of that case and like why those implications are so critical um, in an adverse way for our workers. Totally I, I, I feared that you would um, that you would ask me to talk about Viking River in that kind of way because Viking River is incredibly uh, I've read it several times and I don't understand it at all, which I, I think is actually um, a, a credit to uh, Justice Sotomayor and Kagan and Breyer, who all signed on to the majority opinion, and I think turned it into something that is barely comprehensible, which is, frankly, um, with the Supreme Court, a barely comprehensible opinion is sometimes the best that we can hope for. Um, and that's what we got in, in Viking River. Um, so, but Viking River, I, I do, you know, the issue at stake in Viking River is about um, the viability of a California law that was called the Private Attorney General Act that allows workers to, to, um, to bring suit, not on their own behalf, but on actually on behalf of the state, right? So the state has an interest in enforcing its laws, like the state of California can enforce laws against wage theft or other violations, um, but the state doesn't have the resources to enforce the laws on its own. And so California, like a state, many other states in, in other contexts relies on um, an enforcement mechanism called called QTAM, which is a, a Latin term that uh, doesn't, I mean, th that um, uh, is not very useful, but um, in this kind, of, you know, but to actually describing what's going on. But key TAM cases are cases in which a private individual brings suit on behalf of the on behalf of the state, as opposed to on their on their own behalf. And what's useful, the, the key TAM is a really useful potential mechanism for workers who are other who are prevented and, and other entities who are prevented from bringing suit because of forced arbitration clauses. Forced arbitration clauses prevent states from enforcing the, their laws. And they can't rely on private enforcement to, to make sure their laws are enforced. So they have to find this other way. They can either, you know, multiply their budgets by like 50 times, or they can empower private entities to enforce the law for them. Um, so, so PAGA um, is a really important um, mechanism in California. And after lots of attempts, the chamber finally convinced the court to take up the issue. Um, and the court substantially undermined PAGA in ways that I don't even really fully uh, uh, understand, right? I mean, so, but very briefly, they sort of said, you can't bring a case, basically you can't bring, if, if an arbitration clause says you can't bring a case um, in arbitration and in, involving violations of your coworkers' rights, then that clause is enforceable. 
And so you can't bring PAGA cases on behalf of involving your violations of your coworkers' rights. But at the end of the decision, it got very confusing. Um, and um, uh, Justice Alito sort of suggested, in this opinion joined by the three liberals, that um, you know that, that there was um, an opportunity for um, hi, not says here, um, but um, the um, but so and maybe Naja can explain um, Blaine River better than I. But um, but to 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 briefly uh, wrap it up, I um, the, Justice um, Alito suggested that. Uh, that the question of whether you could bring those claims involving your coworkers, violations of your coworkers' rights, that that was really a question of state law, which it is. That acknowledgement is really important because I think what we will see is that we will see states, the Viking River, is, it opens up an opportunity for states to be more creative about how their laws are enforced and to use private parties to enforce their laws. And even in cases where in federal court, you wouldn't have standing to bring a claim because you weren't sort of personally injured. And, and that's important because um, uh, if you don't have standing in federal court and you have standing in state court, you can't be removed to federal court. And so you're going to stay in state courts. And so I think that there will be, this, there's an opportunity in Viking River, the states that, that pursue bold legislative reforms um, to empower workers, workers' organizations and others to enforce the law, um, to keep cases in state court with friendly state court judges. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, so I want to kind of transition us now into this, you know, idea of, of state courts and the roles that or the role that state courts can play um, in just making worker power issues um, more sympathetic um, in the court specifically. And while federal courts certainly matter, our state courts have the potential to serve as venues for labor justice. Uh, most recently, we play out, play out in Massachusetts where the top court rejected Prop 22. Um, David, you can talk about it. And even attendees who are on the call who are familiar with things like this and want to contribute to the conversation or just like want to add thoughts, feel free to do that. Um, but if you can just talk more about that particular case and what happened there um, and just this idea of organizing um, and how in a lot of cases, the way that it interplays with our judiciary system um, is really critical to transforming um, our, our state benches, um, our federal benches, um, and even most recently our Supreme Court bench with the uh, recent nomination of KBJ. So. so you want me to talk briefly um, about <laughs> um, about um, the Prop 22 case, maybe and then kick it over to Jake, does that, does that sound good? That's fine. Or just if, if we can just talk about the role of organizing in that particular case, or just the general role of organizing as it relates to um, our courts in transforming um, our, judi our judiciary systems. I know Jake is more familiar, at, especially on the state courts level um, with that, um, but whatever you want to offer is fine. Yeah, let's kick it over to, let's kick it over to Jake um, to talk about, to talk about the, I've been talking a lot. So Jake, if you want to talk about the SJC and Prop 22, that'd be awesome. I'm sure I'd be happy to, thank you. Um, and uh, it's Supreme Court, Justices, I think, in many ways are, are very important, not only for all the, all the reasons that David spoke about, but in direct democracy states, justices play an even more important role, because not only are they interpreting the laws and the constitutions of our separate states, um, which in many states can be way more protective for rights and liberties than the federal constitution is, um, but in direct democracy states, they also have the added responsibility of interpreting um, any direct democracy initiatives or propositions that go directly to the people um, and deciding whether or not those propositions are clearly worded, single issue, all the other sorts of constitutional um, uh, requirements for uh, initiatives and propositions at the state level. Um, so that uh, well, I don't know it as well as David, I understand is the issue that really played out um, in the uh, in the case in, in Massachusetts of uh, Proposition 22, um, where the court was really deciding whether or not uh, an initiative uh, to the people that um, involved uh, workers and their ability to be considered 
um, employees uh, was properly worded when it went to the people. Um, and the Supreme Court decided that it was improperly worded, that it wasn't clear enough. Um, because of that, they struck it down um, and uh, in turn afforded a victory for, um, for working folks. Um, is that entirely correct? I don't, I don't want to make, I want to make sure that I'm not overstating here because um, I, I don't know the cases quite as well as you do, David. So if you have any clarification on that, feel free. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's right. Um, but this has played out in several states around the country around initiative, or initiatives and propositions that have come out. So we've seen this play out in Washington where there are direct democracy elect, uh, direct democracy initiatives and a very liberal Supreme Court. We've seen it play out um, in many other states where we have direct democracy. Um, so while our Supreme Court uh, is important for interpreting constitutional provisions and also interpreting um, legislation that comes out of the states, it's additionally important in the states for um, interpreting di direct democracy actions. Um, Massachusetts is maybe not the best example overall for how uh, folks can be directly involved in uh, determining uh, justices and the folks who sit on the courts um, because they play less of a role. Um, the Northeast generally has a system that is uh, a little bit less democratic than maybe some of the Great Lakes states or the Western states or even the Southern states um, around the way that they choose their judges that serve on the courts. Um, but generally speaking, around the country, there are ways that people can be engaged in um, all of these different um, elections by better understanding the courts and who it is that chooses the judges that serve on our state courts. Um, so Massachusetts there, it's uh, way more uh, democratic. Um, uh, sorry, the, it's the governor who it's gubernatorial choice. Um, so there, you know, if you're going to try to make an influence over who it is that serves on the states, uh, state courts there, uh, you should be uh, especially focused on the gubernatorial election. Um, but, uh, you know, generally speaking, there are kind of two general buckets in way in which uh, we choose our, our uh, elected or our judges around the country, about half are appointment, about half are elected, and then of those folks that are elected, uh, about half of those are elected in nonpartisan elections, and about half of those are chosen in partisan elections. And that's very geographically sort of bucketed and, and specific. Um, I could dive in more on that. Um, and Alliance for Justice, we are actually about to launch tomorrow a 50 state map for the entire country that shows um, all the different ways in which justices are uh, chosen across the entire country who all of the justices are, who serve on each of these state Supreme Courts around the country, um, whether they're Republicans or Democrats um, or somewhere in the middle, um, and how you can be involved in all of those different uh, choices for who sits on these Supreme Courts. So whether you know, you're interested in, if you're interested in getting involved and making an impact, um, you know, whether those justices are chosen by their governor, whether they're chosen in a direct election, whether they're chosen in some sort of retention model. Um, there, it shows all the different ways across the entire country to figure out how to be engaged in those races. And we're gonna drop that tomorrow afternoon. I am personally looking very much forward to um, you all dropping that resource. Um, and just on the topic of you all uh, previewing or releasing that resource tomorrow, um, it feels like we're in a point in time where it just like makes sense to start paying a lot more attention and pivoting a lot more of our energy and focus to state courts. Um, you know, I think under the Biden administration, we've seen an unprecedented number of public interest attorneys being put on the federal bench. Um, and also the midterms are coming up uh, later this fall, um, which kind of leaves the balance of Congress in question. But if there are any other reasons, Jake, that you think that right now is a really critical time to start putting focus and attention on state courts, um, would love to hear that from you. Um, yes, thank you. And in some ways, I don't, I don't want to depress everyone, but in some ways, I think it, the situation is even more bleak than David stated at the federal level. And 
And that's because while Republicans have certainly put like full on union busters and, you know, worker busters into these positions of power on our federal courts, lifetime positions of power on our federal courts, um, Democrats haven't been a whole lot better um, in the folks that they've put on either. And it's gotten better under the Biden administration, I'll say. Um, but, you know, the traditional Democratic model for the past 20 to 30 years, basically since President, President Carter, was to expend as little political capital as possible um, on these judicial appointments. And because of that, um, even Democrats uh, kind of ran towards more centrist, corporate-y uh, type folks that they were putting on our federal courts. Um, some really great research that you should definitely check out last year dropped by Joanna, uh, Professor Joanna Shepard at Emory University took a look at our entire federal court system and the professional background and makeup of every federal judge that sits on those, on those courts um, and looked at their professional backgrounds and showed that we have just very, very few folks that come from a non-corporate background that end up on the federal bench. And then took the next step of asking, all right, when it comes to really important cases like um, employment discrimination and, um, and any other sort of like bias or discrimination court, uh, case that goes through the federal courts, um, what uh, did the professional background of a federal judge make any impact on um, the, their, their uh, final decision making in those cases? And it turned out that uh, she found a statistically significant difference um, in folks that have a corporate background, not surprisingly, and this is what we would expect, right, is like you work for years, you know, upholding corporate interests and thinking how to think from their perspective. And then, you know, when you become a judge, you don't just automatically shed that, <laughs> like you carry your biases with you onto the bench, as much as we want to think that judges are, you know, are able to shed all of that when they come onto the bench, they don't, um, we know that. Um, and in these cases in particular, they don't. And what was even more shocking and surprising for me is not only did folks with a corporate background rule, were much more likely to rule for corporations, prosecutors were even more likely to rule for corporations. Former prosecutors were even more likely to rule for corporations and against individuals in discrimination cases than folks that come from a corporate background. So here we have Democrats who have been putting tons of prosecutors and former corporate lawyers onto the bench on the federal courts at the district and the circuit court level. And you know the impact of that is gonna be felt for a generation as these folks are making decisions in, in, um, on these important issues that come up in front of the federal courts. So I, I look you, like really bleakly sort of at the federal courts that, as an arbiter of these rights generally for a very long time, I think, given kind of the, some of those folks that have ended up there. And so the state courts are going to become even more important as a battleground as we go, uh, as we go forward. Um, we're going to have to fight for these courts. And thankfully, you know, the silver lining that I see is that the people have designed these courts to be more responsive to the public. Um, they are elected often. They're elected sometimes in, you know, elections where, you know, their leanings on these issues can be made very clear with a single letter after their names. Um, not always clear, but sometimes clear. Um, and, you know, in that I'm probably speaking from the uh, uh, action campaign hat on um, <laughs> for Alliance for Justice action campaign. Um, but, you know, sometimes I, I, that is clear. And, um, and so people have an opportunity to make a real difference and a real impact. And we have some really big cases coming up. It's some really big, sorry, not cases, some really big um, races coming up in several important Supreme Courts around the country this fall, where people can be engaged and they can make a difference. Um, thank you, because I'm just going to make you segue into talking a little bit more about that. Um, with this fall coming up, um, not only just the races, but ways that everyday people and workers especially can get involved in influencing um, who's being 
whether it's elected to their state courts um, and also who's being appointed um, to their state courts if they happen to live in a state where there are appointment processes um, that may involve putting together a nominating commission of some sort, just ways that folks can engage in various forms of advocacy um, to not only shape what the bench is hopefully going to look like, but also what the people who are putting these people on the benches um, look like. I hope that was clear and made sense. <laughs> um, yeah, and and uh, Naja, to your comment, like absolutely. I, I think we have so far this, and during the Biden administration of the, I don't know, 100 something nominees that have uh, come down from the Biden administration, I can count on one hand the number of uh, folks who have like a true like workers' rights background. Um, we had uh, Sung on the Ninth Circuit, who is really fantastic, and she is a former union organizer and labor lawyer. She will make a wonderful addition to the Ninth Circuit. Um, in the Second Circuit in Connecticut, we actually have a um, former consumer rights advocate who has been nominated to that position. I'm very excited for that. Um, and then we have about three other district court seats where we have like some true um, consumer workers' rights folks. Um, who have been nominated to the bench, um, but five out of 100 is nowhere near as many as we should be seeing during a Democratic administration. Um, and another uh, piece of work that Alliance for Justice is about to drop is a big report on kind of the, the lack of consumer and labor advocates who have been nominated to our federal bench during the Biden administration and really charging the Biden administration with making a, a, a pivot on that towards uh, the end of uh, this, you know, this term and, and hopefully during the next term. Um, so hopefully we will see more, but you're absolutely right that we haven't seen many. Um, for the state courts, um, the big races, sorry, turning to your actual question, Tristan, um, the uh, big races that we're seeing coming up this fall, um, I'll, I'd say that the primary ones is uh, the Michigan Supreme Court is hanging by a thread right now. It's a 5-4 split, um, sorry, a 4-3 split. Um, on that court. And uh, one of uh, the Democrats is up for re-election. Um, he's uh, really quite good on labor and worker rights issues. Um, and then there's an op open seat um, where a um, young sitting uh, member of the state house uh, who would also be the first black woman ever elected to the uh, Michigan Supreme Court um, will be running. Um, for what was a Republican seat on that bench. So that's gonna be a huge race coming up this November. Um, in North Carolina, we have uh, also a 4-3 split court, uh, two um, Democrats, uh, their seats are up this November. Um, that's uh, currently held by the Democrats. And, and these are states where um, it, that there's actually a partisan affiliation. So I'm not, I'm just speaking objectively. <laughs> um, and so uh, two of those Democrats are up. Um, one is seeking re-election. The other uh, is um, term limited out um, and a Democrat is running for that seat um, against, uh, she is currently a, a court of appeals judge and will be running against another uh, court of appeals judge on the Republican side. Um, so two big races there have to hold both in order to hold the North Carolina Supreme Court. Um, then the other major race is going to be in Ohio, um, where we've got three justices uh, who are up. And um, it's also a very even split right now, but it's more Republicans who are, their seats are, are being vacated and are up. And so it's more of an opportunity for a pickup. Um, for Democrats, if they could flip it into a 5-3 court, actually, um, from what's right now a 3-3-1 court. It's uh, three, four Republicans, but one of those Republicans is a little bit moderate and is sided with Democrats on, on some key issues. Um, so those are like the big three races, uh, the big three states. And then other states to keep an eye on are Kansas, um, Montana, um, and Illinois. And I can go into those a little bit more later if you want, but I don't wanna, I wanna overdo it. 
No, that that is all perfect. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'll just add for states um, that are not election based and that have appointment based systems by the governor specifically, um, especially for organizers on the call. Um, I think a lot of times people underestimate just the power of organizationally, um, even individually making pleas, lobbying, advocating um, to these elected officials um, about what these nominating commissions look like. Um, because Jake shared fabulous um, statistical data about just the percentage of former prosecutors um, and former corporate lawyers who have been put um, on the federal bench specifically and how that impacts um, subsequent rulings, especially when it comes to workers' rights issues. Um, and we see the same thing in a lot of these nominated commissions, both on the federal and state level where these commissions are steeped with former prosecutors or current prosecutors and former or current uh, corporate lawyers who are making suggestions um, or making recommendations to the governor, for example, about who should be put um, on the bench. And so just from an organizing perspective, um, I just want want to share that I, I at least think that there's value and a lot of use um, in doing advocacy, of course, um, around elections, um, but also around appointment based um, systems um, where we can shift um, not only the makeup of the benches, but also the makeup of the nominating commissions. Tristan, can I step in there just to, just to tell to tell an anecdote that I heard the other day, which is, could be totally yeah. apocryphal, but it helps to highlight the the opportunities here for organizers. Which is, I had heard. So I I'm based in Colorado and um, do a lot of litigation here. Our our state supreme court is getting better, but it has taken not nearly as good as it as it should be, and it has taken some time for us to overcome a slew of Republican appointments. And I heard recently that one of the reasons we had so many Republicans on the bench is that. Uh, our former governor, now a U.S. senator, had taken the position that um, judicial nominations would replace where you could compromise with Republicans, right? Like you could show that, which is exactly like that is horrible. And we need to make sure that that governors understand that it's precisely where we cannot compromise. Like, I mean, we should I, the broader questions about about like the purposes of um, compromising generally at this point in our politics. But 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 this that is not a place for compromise. Um, and I think that especially at the state level, that like with the, this, we've done a lot at the federal level to at least get people to understand the importance, even if they're not following through in the way that they we want them to, but they're at least talking the talk. At the state level, they're not even talking the talk, right? And we need to make them understand that. So. Um, for sure. Thank you for, go ahead, Jake. All right. I just wanted to jump in because that I, that's so true. And um, oftentimes it's just a matter of inertia more than anything else. Um, sometimes these are just like historically rooted and go back a, a, a ways to a different time in, U in, in US politics. So for example, in, two, in 2020, we were um, you know, looking at a potential flip of the Senate and a flip of the White House. And so trying to do some prep work with some of the, for federal nominations, for some of the federal nominating commissions. And one of the places that we looked at was Washington State, because uh, even though there are two Democratic senators there, um, they have had this nominating commission for federal judges for the last 30 years that goes back to when there was still a Republican senator, um, to where they split the commission evenly between Republicans and Democrats. And the Republicans would filibuster any good judicial nominees that were trying to get through. And for the longest time, even the Democratic nominees that were coming through under a uh, two Democratic senators and a Democratic president were just really milquetoast, pretty awful corporate folks for that for that entire bench. Um, so leading into 2020, reached out to the, the chief counsel for the senior senator for Washington State and just said, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Like, is there opportunity for change? And she was like, yes, there is absolutely an appetite for change. I didn't even know about this. Like, let's have a conversation. What can we do? So we blew it up. We put some civil rights attorneys on there, the head of the ACLU for Washington State, a longtime federal public defender for Washington. And so what did we see coming through out of Washington's nominations for you know, this, these past, this past year and a half? Some of like the most awesome, radical, worker-friendly judges we could possibly have on like 
any state court bench and we flipped the entire federal bench for what for the western district of washington and almost the entire bench for the eastern district of washington and this was all done with a very different panel and all that needed to be done was someone kind of like stepping in and saying oh take a look at this and like have you thought about this and do you want to have a conversation and putting in a little bit of a little bit of elbow grease and like you know putting some pretty awesome radical allies into that into those positions of power um, and I think that there are tons of opportunities to David's point of doing this in several states and in uh, around the country. All it's going to take is like a little bit of organizing and a little bit of elbow grease and some work by folks on the ground. Perfect. So I think that that is a perfect place for this segment, at least, to um, and um, we'll try to save time near the end um, for questions or thoughts. Um, but I want to pass it over now to Roland to share his findings from his research. Um, so take it away, Roland. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, I'm getting a, occasionally a, a weak signal message on my machine. So hopefully this records OK. Um, so, uh, let me just quickly, because I need this kind of crutch in my life. So you, can you all see the, the sort of a new title I gave, uh, mobilizing turnout among low propensity voters using digital communications. So what I did, and I guess where this fits in with the conversation that's been taking place is, you know, uh, so much of this is about politics. And um, so clearly, I think it helps us if we can get uh, poor and working class people to vote, right? This is, if we can, if we can raise the, uh, the voting participation rate among people who don't normally vote because they happen to be, in the, because they're lower SES. So one of, the, one of the strongest predictors of voting is SES, socioeconomic status. And uh, basically the rich vote, uh, middle-class people vote, or don't. So um, we, even in a, a good year, a good presidential election year, we would have maybe around 60, 62% vote turnout. Um, raising that uh, could uh, really help out with all of what you've talked about so far, helping to get uh, governors that will appoint uh, good judges, helping perhaps elect judges in those states where elections take place. So um i'm looking at you know what it takes this is a test of uh of what it takes to try to organize um people who typically don't vote so what was different about this study well most get out the vote campaigns focus on the members of organizations and they usually combine you know get out the vote with uh candidate persuasion this was different um also uh in most most studies show that digital methods help getting people out to vote, yet there are very few tests I'm looking at digital. What I mean is kind of the, you know, over the phone, text messages and so forth, um, social media. Very few tests uh, looked at how these uh, methods uh, uh, mobilize the poor. Well, what we did here, uh, this group in Michigan, was focusing on what they call low propensity voters, what defined as you know, persons with very little, uh, either sparse or zero voting history, typically living in poor neighborhoods, um, often disproportionately people of color uh, in urban areas, although they did also uh, organize here in Michigan in the, uh, uh, the uh, First Nations people uh, groups as well. So that was one of that was one thing that was a little bit different. They were um, they were doing something. They were organizing the group. And and why is this important? Because as I just sort of laid out, uh, I think this is where the biggest effect can be. If we want to raise turnout and affect politics, um, go after the people who aren't voting and try to get them to the polls. Right. Um, so another difference here was it was just get out the vote. They didn't try to persuade people about the candidates. It wasn't any of there wasn't any of that. Uh, uh, no sort of um, you know voting sheets of who to choose and who not to choose. Um, just get out the vote, which simplified the message and it also focused the message on a, a civic responsibility to to participate in politics. Um, 
The other big effect in 2020 was, of course, COVID, right? COVID changed so much. Um, we know from prior research that, that the best way to mobilize people is with face-to-face, -face, you know, in-person um, outreach. You, you couldn't do that. So they had to, this group had to go, uh, had to um, uh, use digital methods uh, to be safe. And, and, and responsible. What they did do in, in, uh, to kind of replace the lack of the personal connection is they had what were called trusted messengers. So the communities would have a uh, what they call a trusted messenger. This is someone who was, uh, you know, a popular person, well known, a community leader that was hired to do a lot of the mobilizing, and that was a person who sent the messages out. Um, Finally, uh, and what, what we think helped us is that the mail registration and voting itself, you know, could be done. That, that was all liberalized because of COVID. So Michigan was one of many states, right, that, that allowed workers um, a much easier time to register and vote by mail. Um, so here was the structure of the test. Now, this is a classic uh, experimental design, pre-test, post-test, control group design. I say this to underscore that I think those of us in the progressive side of politics need to do more of this so that we um, get better at what we do. Um, uh, it's not hard to do. It just takes a little bit of planning up front and a little bit of analysis at the back end. But uh, if anyone listening here now wants uh, wants to talk about that later, just please contact me. But basically, you use randomization, a very powerful tool, to assign some people to voter mobilization and other people to, to that don't have it. I mean, it just it's it requires some planning and some setup. Um, our sample had uh, 1,822 low propensity voters. Uh, living in Pontiac, Michigan, there were roughly 600 persons per treatment. So it was a strong test. Um, uh, one treatment was a series of, of digital uh, messaging, like texts and appeals to register and to vote, um, all either on someone's phone or online in some way. Uh, Facebook was used as well. There was a second treatment that included all of the above, plus a message at the very end where we said to people, um, you're part of a study, we might call you later to see how the voting experience went. And we did that because there's research showing that if you, if, if people are believe that someone's going to call them about their voting experience, that'll motivate them to the polls. So we added that on. And um, we use data from public records. Again, one of the advantages of, of doing this kind of research is the data are public. You can get the data, uh, anyone can get it. We also use demographic data from the VAN, the Voter Action Network. So here were the results. Uh, our control group uh, turned out, um, this is based upon the regression results. The control group turned out at 26.9%. Um, and let's just say this was roughly double the previous election. So there were a lot of people motivated to go to the polls in 2020. A lot of people in 2016 sat out the, the election. Um, people went to the polls. And we had treatment one. This was the just the digital messaging and the, the Facebook uh, uh, encouragements. They came out and turned out at 22.2% lower. And then there was treatment two. That was the messaging that included uh, the notice that they might be called later to ask them about their voting experience. And that was 25.5%, no different than the control. So as you might, you know, these were somewhat disappointing results because our treatment folks, the folks that we did do outreach to, um, that, that group uh, turned out at a lower rate than the control, right? So the question is why? Well, uh, um, so first, you know, for, you know, you could say it was this a statistical oddity, right? It could just be, 
these things happen. Sometimes you just get a bad draw. Uh, randomization usually works, although we did all kinds of pretests first. Randomization uh, usually works, but in this case, maybe it didn't. That's one possibility. Um, another possibility, which is when I debriefed the folks involved about the findings, they thought that this one was a fairly, uh, fairly strong possibility that there's contamination in the control due to noise from other forms of mobilization. Um, this is always a threat whenever you're doing an experimental study in a field setting. Um, and of course, the last, the 2020 election was a huge election with just a lot of messaging out there. So it's very easy to get wrapped up in the, in, in, in the noise and, and for your particular message from your group to be drowned out. Um, there's also this possibility of the bystander syndrome. If you don't know what that is, I'll just quickly, bystander syndrome is this idea that in any kind of social context, when there's an emergency and action is needed, if people feel that uh, others are gonna just handle it, they just don't do anything, right? Um, so by getting many, many messages, perhaps the folks that got so many messages felt like it's all taken care of and they didn't have to step up and act. Um, and then perhaps the trusted messenger idea wasn't trusted by all, right? So let me, just uh, conclude and then we can chat. I mean, basically what the study, if the study's findings are valid, what this suggests is that the digital stuff does not work for people who are poor. It doesn't work for those folks. And it suggests that what we need to do is, is try something else uh, uh, to, to make it work, um, uh, to get people out to vote. and. Uh, I guess that's the main lesson and kind of a disappointing one. So the easy stuff doesn't work. You gotta get out there and mobilize uh, people face to face, uh, get them in buses and cars, get them to the polls, hand them the registration forms, all that, that stuff. Thanks. Thanks Roland. Um, that's at least super helpful information to me. And I think just coming um, from that conversation talking earlier about just how we can uh, effectively, you know, approach transforming state court benches specifically having that type of data is really helpful. So I am going to open the floor up to other folks on the call at this time. Um, if you have any questions or thoughts that you want to share, um, please feel free to do so. Roland Jake asked, uh, what did those digital communications look like? Um, and did any of those communications include texting? Oh yeah, yeah, there were many texts. And uh, they were often, um, again, the idea was that they weren't just a text from some bot or some remote. I mean, it was a trusted messenger sending this and his team. So they tried to make that connection digitally. Um, and it was hard you know, uh, to kind of keep track of how many, but what, what some of the activists, what some of the, uh, the mobilizers were telling us is that toward the end, people just got tired of seeing the text messages. Some of them completely felt like, they, did I freeze up on you? Just a little bit, but okay. I, you, I, I think you're back. I get it. Okay. So basically I, the, there was sense. There was a sense from some of the organizers when we debriefed that um, that they were getting too many messages, that they were just bombarded with it, and they were perhaps frustrated by it. I mean, that maybe is another reason. Perhaps people rebelled and said, "I'm not going to vote. I'm getting too many messages." That that could have been another reason. I have a question. You know, since Jake asked this, I'm going to ask Jake a question. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned. <laughs> You mentioned Jake, because uh, you know, we're here, right? We're a small group. Um, you mentioned that uh, in terms of judges, uh, there's some that are appointed, others elected. And of the elected group, there's elected uh, partisan and nonpartisan. Do you know of any uh, good research on this that, that 
that tests whether or not the decisions by these judges are different on like similar policies. Has anyone done that? Have you laid that out or do you, do you know of research on that? That's a super interesting question. Um, I, I haven't, I don't know. There are a couple of really good researchers who do work on judicial decision-making, um, but there isn't a great, uh, there isn't a great national database of judges and their backgrounds and where they come from um, and how they make their way onto the bench. So that would be kind of like the first uh, order problem is the data, right? You have to A, have all the information on who they are, how they get onto the bench. Um, then you would also have to have a similar uh, set of data on the types of decisions that they're making. And that's easy at the federal level to compare various judges because you've got all the same, same law that you're dealing with. But on the states, you'd have to somehow figure out how to um, normalize it across all the different states. And I imagine that that would be really, really challenging. Um, so maybe you could do like subsets and just do it like within a state. If you had a state where there was a difference between say how judges in one place were put on the bench versus judges in another. Um, but I could see there being some major issues with actually how trying to like design the research study because of that. Um, yeah, it wouldn't be wouldn't be easy. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, it it does seem like it goes right to the heart of what you were talking about, right? Is that the, you know the way these appointments are made, or the way that they're elected, and who they are, and their backgrounds? I mean, even forgetting the backgrounds for a moment, you know, the corporate versus the pro worker types, right? Even just focusing on how they get there, which might be uh, doable, no? I mean, I mean that, that might be, you might be able to grab, kind of wrap around that. And then if we could find policies that are, uh, like you say, you know, somewhat common across states in different contexts. Um, anyway, potential no, study, potential study there, if, if you want to, to talk more about it when this is all I mean, well, one problem that occurs to me is that in a lot of states where there are elections right the parties have served in like the primary system have served this gatekeeper role so i'm not sure in a lot of states where there hasn't just been much attention on it that's made much difference right jake is that is that what i don't know what your what people's head is on that um i i could see it making a difference in in how these folks like come up through the system, whether or not there's any kind of response mechanism through a democratic yeah. process, just feeling, um, yeah. just feeling that pressure, um, that maybe that would have some sort of like influence on their overall decision making because they would see. So we see it often in the other direction, right? So the way that this often comes up is you get big right wing attack groups that don't like the way that judges decide on workers' rights. And so they decide instead, they're gonna go create this big campaign about criminal decisions by those judges. Yeah. And sometimes often like totally made up and, and false to see, like making up kind of a problem and will launch these huge ads on yeah. judges. And there have been tests around whether or not elected judges in those situations make different types of decisions on criminal justice issues when they're in election year versus in a non-election year. So um, Alex Mark, a professor at Wesleyan has done some specific testing around that um, on judicial decision-making during election years and non-election years. And so you, you could see a similar sort of thing, right? If there- Did he is find a, a difference? What's did that? Find, did he find a difference in his study? Um, she and yes, yeah, she did. She she found difference in election year cycles um, than in non election cycles. They tended to be harsher around criminal defendants in election year cycles than in off cycles. Um, oh, to show their show show their tough on crime. Then yeah, exactly. Okay. So I guess the the question could be: Is in a similar sort of sort of situation where there was a pro worker base that was likely to be mobilized around an election? whether or not judges felt a similar sort of pressure towards a pro-worker outcome. 
or, and, you know, and whether they could be pushed into that through advertising and other sorts of means that right now the right wing uses often around criminal justice issues. It's a great question. And, you know, one that could potentially, um, yeah. you know, change, change. Yeah, change. It's, it's a great study. Can I make just one observation that I find just so striking about listening to this, Kristen, is that, is that um, which is that I think that, and it's really important for us all to keep in mind as we talk about like organizing around these issues, um, which is that I think that, I mean, lawyers have a billion blind spots, right? But this is like one of those blind spots that lawyers have that like non-lawyers don't have, right? So when you talk to like the stuff, I'm like, oh my gosh, like people with corporate backgrounds rule against workers. That I think that that's like more interesting to lawyers than it is to not non lawyers. They're like, yeah, obviously, right? And and I think one of the things that we need to do as lawyers more is reinforce to non lawyers like, no, this is, this matters, and this is your domain. This is your domain, right? So don't back off, right? Like, could keep holding us accountable because because we're just so susceptible to like the way lawyers think and talk and the institutional pressures and like more attention from non lawyers from organizers from um uh from unions on courts will just make such a big difference in shining a light on the crap that we see all the time right like um because we for, in too many places we've just like left the courts up to lawyers and that's where things have gotten screwy so that's so true david it's only lawyers that are like i'm shocked shocked the judges aren't independent <laughs> Totally. Of course they're not. <laughs> um, no, but I'm glad you brought that point up, David. And I recognize that we are one minute until five. Um, but I'll just end it at least by saying um, that on the topic of just like lawyers and the judiciary, um, this whole process, right, um, I think even both on the state and federal level has not only like kind of conditioned lawyers specifically to what they believe um, is just kind of like the normal way of going things, but it has kind of disrupted going all the way to law students specifically, um, just the career trajectory that people even choose for themselves, especially if they have an interest in doing things like clerking or making their way to the, to the judiciary to become a federal or state court judge. And so just kind of organizing around this idea, especially when it comes within legal circles um, to, push for more public interest folks to be put on the bench, um, I think just can go as far as interrupting um, the way folks deviate from the path that they're interested in, um, in terms of their career trajectory, um, or even shift that for some people um, who may not have thought they had an interest in public interest work. Um, but if, you know, folks are just organizing around transforming the benches we have now, but also the benches that we have in the future um, for students who are coming through uh, law schools um, who have an interest in being public interest attorneys, um, you know, I think there's value in just kind of disrupting this narrative. So those students who could or potentially have the ability to be just kind of these transformative judges that they want to be don't necessarily feel forced or pushed into making their way into corporate settings or prosecutor prosecutorial settings um, to become judges. Um, I don't know. I just think that we've been conditioned to accept this as acceptable. Um, and um, I think it has a lot of ramifications that go beyond the cases that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but thank you all so much <laughs> for listening to my little last minute soapbox bill. Um, but thank you all for joining this segment with us. Um, if folks want to drop your information in the chat, um, if you want to follow up um, via email or whatever, totally fine. But thank you so much for joining. And I'll give folks a few minutes before ending it to drop their contact information. Um, in the chat. And thank you, Roland, Jake, um, and David for joining and contributing to this very um, lively and I think useful discussion. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.